Well, we want to welcome you here today. We're going to be talking about the next several weeks. We're going to be talking about, let me get what I affectionately call my Charles Stanley chair. Uh, this is a doctor's order thing, so I'm going to kind of get in my Charles Stanley chair and figure out how that works. You all be patient with me a minute. At any rate, uh, we're going to be talking for the next several weeks about patterns of non-compliance that spell disaster for a culture. God has given us a set of guidelines and rules that we need to go by. And we, uh, we don't do very well with that. That's the truth. Uh, we, uh, we have our own ideas, our own terminology, our own way of seeing things. And there's one thing that has happened for sure in the midst of all this, and that, and that is this. We have found out that our ways don't work. Uh, we have a culture that is spinning completely out of control, and uh, part of that is, can be laid at the steps of God's people. Brother Bob, and I thank you for Sunday school. We had such a good interaction time, I thought, Sunday school this morning. I thought it was really great. But I want to call your attention, if I may, to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6. And I was starting to say that Brother Bob had talked about this uh, some time ago. And I want to read some of this to you. And it says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God and keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God your, of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and these words I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall ask of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and ye shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. And God, we uh, desire and grieve in some way because we see that your word has been discounted by so many people. And yet that's the stuff that make our society what it is. And it makes our homes what they should be. So God, it's a grievance to me when I see that you have commanded us to do certain things and we have failed to do it. God, help us to uh, want to revitalize our culture and our country and to live in your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are several things here that we look at when we start talking about the Word of God, and what it is that you and I need to be doing. He gives a clear declaration where he says, Hear, O Israel. Why not? Who is Israel? Well, that's God's people, right? This is not for the world. This is not for the people at large. This is for God's people. That means it's for you and me. It's the people who have come to Christ, for those people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, for those who we seek to please God with their lives and want to please God with their lives, this is whom this word is given to. It is, it is a word that you and I then 
since it is from the very mouth and the hand of the Lord, have a need to, as well as an obligation to, obey. Now, one of the things that we have to talk about, when I was thinking about this passage of Scripture this week, and as I was preparing for today's uh, message, was there's two words that came to my mind. The first one that came to my mind was accountability, and the other was culpability. Now, these are two terms we need to explore. One is an adverb, and the other is an adjective. But they have meaning in that we have a responsibility before God to lead a life that is correct and right. This word accountability means answerable. We are answerable to God for the way we conduct our life. Not only in the church, but also at home. Not only at home, but the way we conduct ourselves in the businesses that we visit, in the society that we move in. People ought to look at us and see in us the, the person of Jesus Christ. And if they do not see the person of Jesus Christ, and they don't see God's laws having an effectual uh, place in our lives, then God says we are accountable for that. That's what he told these people. He said you're accountable today for these words. You have an accountability before me to obey me, to trust me, to walk with me. There's an accountability there. Then there's also the word culpability. When we talk about culpability, though, this is uh, what we mean by that. We mean that there is, in the culpable part of this, there is a dictate that you and I are to obey God's word. There is this idea that that needs to be a part of our lives. Now Isaiah says, and I'm going to give you the Bible verses. I'm going to, I probably won't wait long enough for you to turn in your Bible there, but you would need to write them down if you're taking notes. But in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, a passage of Scripture that you all are very familiar with. It says this, Come now and let us reason together says the Lord. And this Lord here is capitalized. That's L-O-R-D as it was also in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And this word Lord means Yahweh. It's a word they could not use. This means the all-sufficient one. This means the self-existent one. This means God Almighty. This is, the, this is God with exclamation points behind it. This is the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, in verse 19. For the mouth, there's this word, L-O-R-D capitalized, has spoken. So, there is a twofold proposition here as we look at these two words of, of culpability and we look at these words and we understand what they mean. He said, look here, there is a forgiveness that I have offered. There is a way that God has offered. There is a way that is prosperous. There is a way where I can, you can come before me and your life can be clean. And you can get your life straight. And you can live right. And you can do right. And if you reason this thing out in your own mind. If you reason it on out in your own mind. You will see that. This is the reasonable way to act. Do you know that disobeying God is, unre is unrealistic? <laughs> That's an unreasonable way to act. That's not the way to do that. We have a, we have a, we have a responsibility to before God so that we are not blameworthy. And that's what culpability means. That we have the blame taken away from us. How does that happen? That happens through the blood of Jesus, does it not? Jesus died on the cross, paid our sin debt, that you and I might have life in him. Isn't that what it's all about? And so Jesus then makes us clean. 
But what happens if we refuse the sacrifice that Jesus has made? What happens if we refuse that blood sacrifice that Jesus so freely made on, in your behalf and in mine? Well, then we are held accountable and culpable before God for our own lives. And he says here that if you refuse the offer of forgiveness, if you refuse this place that I have set out for you, the forgiveness that I have offered for you, then you have to handle it on your own as a rebel against God, and that won't go well for you. That is not even reasonable. Why would a man in his right mind or a woman or child or anybody else consciously completely rebel against God and his word? Why would you do that? Does that make sense? Well, the devil comes along and says, well, yeah, it makes perfect sense. No, it doesn't. Because there's going to come a day when you're going to have to give an account before God for your life. And if it's not the life that God had intended for you, that God had planned for you, that God had offered you, and you've rebelled against God's word, and you've rebelled against the dictates of God, it isn't going to go well. Not going to go well at all. So, in our society, we have had some things that have happened that have changed the way our society operates. Our society is not a godly society. Is that, is that a surprise to you? It's a godless society. Our, you know, let's call it what it is. Our culture is a godless culture. It's a me culture. What I want. What I think. Where I want to be. What I want to do. It's a self-centered culture that is not a God-centered culture. Well, when you start looking at some of the rules of the legislation that is being pulled, that is being uh, sent out, in our, not only in our state legislators, but also in our, our national legislation, it becomes wildly clear to anybody who's a thinking person that we are not living to the dictates of God. We are not living as God would have us to live. You know, I think about this in terms of 19 se and 77 years ago, in 1945 to be exact. World War II ended, right? All the soldiers came home. That great generation that had preserved us the freedoms that we had. And within a few years, there was a change in the way that we saw things. All of a sudden, we became prosperous. All of a sudden, we had everything that we need. We started being a forward-moving country, and this country had prayed and spit, spit its face on uh, before God during the war to win the war, and God blessed America, and we got through the war, but we shortly after the war forgot all the promises we made to God. We made a shift. We made a paradigm change in that now it became... Not what does God want for our country, but what can I do to advance my own cause, so to speak. Prosperity took over. Prosperity began to become the rule. We started to get better cars. We began better equipment, better everything. The society began to be progressive in that the science that came out and all of the things that went on. And our country became prosperous and becoming prosperous we changed from a God-centeredness to a self-centeredness in my mind that was a devastating blow to our culture if you think about it now we can pay someone else to take on our responsibilities and free up our time for more important things. What are those more important things that we are all of a sudden freed up to do? Is it to worship God and to serve God? Since this new thing took over in our culture, most of our churches have emptied out. Many churches are closing. And the churches that do exist are there and they are feeding the culture by offering those things that the culture wants in a world of prosperity. We have what we call, what some have called, the prosperity gospel right now. 
You know, live well, be well, blah, 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 right? And so now then the churches, which were once a center for godliness and teaching and preaching the word of God, have now become cultural centers where people go to be entertained. To get the things that they want. To get some things that were not there before. And some have done that very successfully. We no longer have a culture raised on that raised gardens or vegetables. We back in the early days we raised our own meat, amen. You raised your own cow, your own pig, right? You butchered that rascal come winter. You had ways to do that. In the garden, you preserved everything that you could in the garden, and what you couldn't preserve in the garden, you can, right? You didn't go to the grocery store buy a can of green beans. You didn't go to the grocery store buy a side of beef or anything else. No, you raised it all. But we became a prosperous nation, and we prospered, and we had the money and the wealth, so we stopped doing the things that we did before, right? And that time that we freed up, that free time that we now have, have how do we use it? Do we use it spending and serving God? Or do we use it serving ourselves, our own needs, and our own wants? That's a tough question, isn't it? You know, we talk about tithing. And, of course, you know, the scripture teaches that 10% of everything that we earn belongs to the Lord. Amen? It comes back to him. That's, that's the tithe. That's what the tithe is. A lot of churches even quit talking about tithe anymore. But do you know what? Every minute of every day that you have, day in and day out, every hour, every minute you have, you have by the grace of God. Amen? Have you ever tithed on what God has given you there? Oh, it's easy to talk about tithing our money, but what about our time? How much time are we giving to the Lord in our lives? How much time are we doing those things that are profitable in those things? How we use this newfound freedom that we have now gotten? Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore because I have enough money. I'll just hire it done. Amen? I'll just hire it done. I got enough money. I can pay for that. No big deal. I remember young, being young in my ministry, I didn't have the money to pay for a mechanic. That's part, that's part of the reason I became a mechanic. I had to fix my own ragged cars, which were always falling apart. Right? So I learned to improvise. I learned to make do. Now if I have a flat tire, I pray that I can get enough air in it to get it to the gas station so they can change the tire. I don't take the lug nuts off anymore. <laughs> right? My heart done. Why? Because I have the money to do that. Well, in what ways has this changed the culture that we live in? And as we begin to look at Deuteronomy and we begin to look at what God says here, God wanted us and set out a family that would please God. And now what he was about, and now what it was about, and now what God wanted to do. Notice what he said. He said here that our families, right? And these words which I command you shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently, right? To your children. Are we doing that? How much time have you spent working with your children, making them the godly people that God intended for them to be? How much time have you spent on that this week? There's been a shifting of responsibilities that has happened. I reminded, when I was growing up, we had country music. My grandparents wanted country music. Anybody remember who Porter Wagner was? <laughs> Some of you here barely enough to know who Porter Wagner was. Porter Wagner used to have a song. He's, and it went, there's a family Bible on the table. And from the family Bible, Dad would read. And I can hear 
my mother softly singing, Rock of Ages, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. How much time do we spend getting our families together around the Bible that we've been commanded to teach them, right? Diligently, right? How much time have we spent with our family around the table reading Dad? Notice the word was Dad, not Mom. Dad, reading the Bible. Hello? And Mom singing the choruses and the praises, right? So you have the word and you have the spirit enacted in the home and God blessing that home. I like that song. It's a country song. I could sing it to you, but then you'd accuse me of being a country rock star or some other thing. But the truth of the matter is, we have gone a long ways away from that. When Porter Wagner sang that song when I was a kid, that was the culture. You know what it is now? It's a television set. I bet if you took a survey today and asked how many families gather at the table and eat together, that doesn't happen anymore. They have trades. They sit on the couch and they watch TV. They, their family doesn't get together. They don't even pray together. There used to be an old saying said, the family that prays together stays together. When was the last time you gathered your family around the table, opened the Bible, had prayer and sang, had a worship service in your home with all this free time that God has given you? Wow. Wow. You know why we don't do that? Because we have transferred that responsibility, the accountability and the culpability from ourselves to something else. And we're paying a terrible price for it today. It's showing up in our school systems. It's showing up across the board in this country and it is not God honoring. I remember my grandfather, Ari Maynard. What a strange name, Ari. But my grandfather, well, he's my great-grandfather, used to sit around and we'd get together on the porch or wherever and we'd sit down and he'd drag out the old fiddle and he'd play the fiddle by ear. And the family would get together and we'd talk and we'd have a good time in the old front porch, right? And we'd drink lemonade or iced tea or whatever, homemade ice cream and the old, you know, you got to crank it thing, you know. You didn't plug it in, you crank it, right? All those times we got together on the front porch, spending time together, just talking with each other, getting to know each other. He also made fishing lures. He sat on the porch and carved them. And I remember as a young boy, going over watching him make those fishing lures. I probably have told you that before. Then I had an other uncle named Uncle Hawk. And Uncle Hawk taught me and showed me many valuable things about how to garden, how to keep mowing equipment working well. You know what kind of mower he had? It wasn't gas. <laughs> it was a push mower. He showed me how to take a file out there and sharpen the blades on that push mower. Now then we go to the lock, to the barn, we get out our push mower, we stick the key in the slot, we turn it on and it starts itself, amen? We don't even push it anymore, it's self-propelled. Is all that good for us? You see, we've displaced the family and the family gathering and our worship as a family for something else. And you know what? We're paying a horrible price for that. Would you agree? Have you thought about that? The other thing is the church. The church has somehow gotten the responsibility to train our children spiritually. That is not what God said, is it? Is the church important? Yes. Is gathering together important? Yes. We talked about it in Sunday school. It's vital. 
But listen, it was never meant to replace the family unit. The church is the family unit, if you'll excuse the term, on steroids. The church. Well, I don't have to train my children. I don't have to pray with my children. I don't have to. I mean, we go to church when, it, when we can and when it's easy and when we don't have anything else to do. We'll drag our kids over there and they'll sit and listen to the preacher preach and we'll sing a few songs and we'll go home. Cha-ching. We're done. Right? We punched our time clock for God this week. Woo, we're good. Huh? No. No, you're not good. No, it's not good. God is not a sidebar in our life. He's the main thing in our lives. And while the church is there to support the home and to support our activities in the home, it is not to replace the worship that we do in our homes and the celebration of God that we do in our homes. What do you do when nobody's looking? What do you do when nobody's looking? Don and I are the only two in our household. But do you know we pray over every meal? We get prayer requests all through the day, through the week, and we stop and we pray. Do you know we talk about the Bible at home? We try to feed our spiritual... Listen, we have worship services at our house. We listen to other preachers who preach the Word of God. We're involved in that. Why? Because we need to grow. We read books. We do those things. But the church can never become the training ground for what God gave you to do. It's your responsibility, folks, to train your children. Amen? It's your responsibility to pray with your kids. It's your responsibility to teach them the gospel hymns. It's your responsibility to spend time with them. It's your, it's your problem, not the church's. There's another one that has really, really wrecked our spirituality. And that's the school. We don't train anymore because after all, we have teachers who are professionals who are training our kids, right? What are they training them? Are they training them the same things that we would train them? Are they training them to follow God? Are they training them to do those sort of things? And the answer is, for the most part, no. God has been kicked out of the schools, amen? You see, if you leave those responsibilities to somebody else, you will come up short. Training is the responsibility of the individuals that God has placed in the life of the child so that when they grow up, they will know and follow his ways. We learned that in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, do we not? Where it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I've heard people talk about that they raised their children in church and they went to church, but as soon as they got old enough to be on their own, they vacated the church and they don't go anymore and they don't have, you know why? Was it a breakdown because of the problem at the church and the, the churches were not what they should be? And I'll take some responsibility for that. But you know what? It broke down because there was nothing in the home that supported the church. That's what happens. When you leave those things out, you leave those things undone, there's always a price to pay for that. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1, it says, Children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So if a child disobeys a parent, is that right? Well, no, it's wrong, isn't it? You know, when I ask my children to do something, I have an expectation that they're going to do it. Amen? 
If I tell them not to do that, I did that for a reason, not just to, not just to keep conversation going. I did that because I deemed that to be in their best interest and I wanted them to grow up well and I wanted them to do well and I wanted them to be real. I wanted them to respect God. I wanted them to respect God's house. I wanted them to respect the property of God, the purpose of God, and the plan of God. And if I don't tell them what it is, they're going to do their own thing, guys. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, Ephesians 2, 6, 2, quotes it, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live on the earth. In other words, long life. We read that here in Deuteronomy, didn't we? Long life. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Now this is all about training and love, guys. Firm and devotion to those lives God has entrusted you with. Remember, for most of us, parenthood was a choice that we made. Right? Nobody forced you to be a parent. You did that on your own. Be fruitful and multiply. The Lord told Adam and Eve. Amen? And we have that desire. I remember something Mark Lowry once said about uh, uh, Guy Penrod. He said, "Lord, when the Lord gave that commandment, Brother Penrod, he didn't mean just you alone. Because <laughs> guy has a bunch of kids. Train them. With every new soul God plants in your house, you have a responsibility and a culpability and an accountability that comes with that child. Amen? Or oh me. Grandparents also need to provide general guidance. But most of the time anymore, grandparents are saw as intruders rather than ones who bless in the home. My grandparents did a lot of work with me. <laughs> because to tell you the truth, mom and dad got really tired. <laughs> they needed help. <laughs> my dad would say to my mom, send Bob to his grandpa. I've had it. <laughs> I need a break. My grandparents were a blessing. They were there. They supported the family. By the way, they supported the church. They supported the religious activity that went on in my life. In Titus chapter 2, and I'm going to have to finish here, and I'll have to give you the next of it next week. But in Titus chapter 2, it says this, in 2, that the older men may be sober and reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and in patience, this goes back to this discipline in life that would discipline our children and teach them the things of God. Like I said, this is going to be a series. And I shall have to get back to this next week. But it, here's the thing I want you to see in closing. Matthew Henry the famous Bible commentator who lived in the 6th century, right? Taught, was taught this creed by his godly father. By the way, if any of you read David Jeremiah's devotionals, it was in the devotional yesterday. I, I would like to say that I researched and found this, but I'll let David Jeremiah do this work for me. But it says this, I take God, the Father, to be my God. I take God the Son to be my Savior. I take God the Holy Ghost to be my sanctifier. I take the Word of God to be my rule. I take the people of God to be my people. And I do hereby dedicate and yield my whole self to the Lord. 
And I do this deliberately, freely, and forever. Amen. What did we read in the book of Deuteronomy at the beginning of this? You shall what? Diligently, right? You shall teach, teach them diligently. We will never become the culture that God planted us to be on this planet until we start once again obeying God. Until we get it in our heart and mind that we're going to believe and obey God and we're going to do things in God's order and God's way and that's the way it's going to work because we are the people of God and we should not expect our culture to do it and to replace it for us. We do it. It's our job to do that. And until we take that responsibility upon ourselves, we will have a culture that fails. I'm going to talk more about this next week. I want to encourage you to be here because there's some important things that you and I need to get our minds and hearts straight on. Father, we delivered your word. We've done what you've asked us to do. We pray that you bless our time together. Help us as your people to follow your statutes. God, you've commanded us. You spoke to us. God, we hear. And God, we look at our culture and our society. And Lord, I hear a lot of people saying today, where did we go wrong? How did this happen? Why are we killing so many of our children? And why are we doing these things today? God, I believe it's because we have rebelled against your word. God, we need broken hearts. We already have broken homes. God, break our hearts. Help us to mold our lives once again around you. Help us to become the people of God in a place where we live so that your name is glorified and lifted up among the heathen. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.